Hello, you're listening to the Lunatics Radio Hour, and this is our third installment and final installment of our three-part series about monsters. I'm Abby Branker. Across from me, across the room, is Alan Kudan. Hello. And today we are talking about vampires. Vampires? Did I say vampires? No, but that's how you say it in Transylvania. Oh, have you been to Transylvania? No, I only buy my wine from there. <laughs> that's right. We previously covered Frankenstein's monster and werewolves, so you can go back and check those out if you haven't already. Mm-hmm. Today we're going to talk about the very long history of vampires. I actually had a lot of fun researching this. I imagine it's quite old. Oh, it's quite old. Like vampires themselves. Yes. Immortal even. Mm. Mm. How, how far back does it go? It goes back to B.C. B.C.? Mm-hmm. Before Christ. You, you mean B.C.E., before Common Era. Yeah, I do. I do mean that. Apologies. I, I did see 10,000 B.C. Mm-hmm. When? No. What, you were there? You saw it? No, I saw the movie back in high school. That's a movie? Was it high school? No. But I remember seeing, yeah, 10,000 B.C., I've never it's heard about, of that. about these like mammoth hunter cavemen type uh-huh. people. Uh huh. They do the mammoth hunter cave hunting type things. Mm-hmm. Was there vampires in that? None whatsoever. Oh. Got it. Got it. Which which was my point. Uh huh. Okay. So yeah, it's newer than that. Okay. Yeah. Got it. I'll give you the exact date actually. Oh, what is it? When we get into it. Oh. Yeah, you gotta keep listening. I'm excited. <laughs> I've really been enjoying these little dives into monsters. Yeah. I mean, the universal monsters hold a very special place in both of our hearts. Mm-hmm. And to really flesh it out and learn a bunch of new things has been really cool. Yeah. It's cool to, I think, get behind or to understand more about the history of something, too, and sort of what it means in a broader sense. And, you know, and I think, like, you don't have to do that all the time. Like, just having fun monsters also has its place. Mm-hmm. But for some of these, especially, like werewolves which was last episode and vampires which are so so historic and so tied to politics and society and religion Mm -hmm. that it's interesting to understand the roots because they're still so relevant today and they're in you know we have twilight we have a billion different things are really fresh and new that feature werewolves and vampires and so it's cool to see how enduring they've been you know i think now is a good time to address the fact that we've only covered three of the universal monsters sure so that was Frankenstein, the Wolfman, and Dracula. Dracula. Mm-hmm. And this leaves out our two two of our favorites, which I think are. I mean, it's hard to pick a favorite, but I think of the left out are w- would be the winners of Invisible Man and Creature from the Black Lagoon. Yeah, yeah, but we add, you know, sometimes you got a schedule to fit. But you know, the podcast is not ending at the end of october so we can cover them in the future oh wow yeah great news it's great news for you and everybody else yeah wow yeah so there's time left to cover them you know what i thought you were gonna say what i thought you were gonna say now is a really good time to talk about twilight i mean it feels a bit premature to talk about twilight okay but we can do you want to or do you want to save it for the big reveal at the end i think for the big reveal at the end okay all right. Well, because, stay well, tuned to learn about Twilight. Well, I'm going off your typical format here. Uh-huh. You like to do your history chronologically. Uh-huh. So right now we're talking about something BC. You won't tell me the year. But I know when Twilight takes place. Mm-hmm. And that's way later than that. Okay. So does that mean that you're agreeing before we start the history to jump in with sidebars that are chronological as we go because i think i will admit with werewolves we had some trouble with that i will attempt okay to stay in a chronological okay let's see how it goes we'll see okay. no promises here we go here we go so as always i'm citing my sources mm-hmm. which are wikipedia vampire origins from the fear channel the fear channel mm-hmm. a ted ed talk with stanley stepanik and that geo article called the bloody truth about vampires an article from The Atlantic called Life Among the Vampires, and a book, Fright Favorites, by David J. Skull, which is part of the TCM release that actually my mom sent me this year. So thank you, Mom. That was very helpful. As someone that has leafed through that book, it looks great. 
Yeah, it's a great book. TCM Highly- has some really cool books around and like easy to read books around different like subsections and genres and things. So I would check that out too if you're looking for like good recommendations. Yeah. And it has like really cool history behind a lot of the films. Do they have a good book on the creature from the Black Lagoon? I'm sure that they do. But the creature is also featured in this book, I'm sure. Ooh. So I can also use it when we do that episode. Great. Someday well, spoilers, in the future. Yeah. Well, we just talked about doing it. Cool. <laughs> Are you paying attention at all? In- implic- implicitly. In- okay. Vampires mean different things to different cultures. But the most general and unifying attribute is a being that requires a vital essence, usually blood, to survive. Mm. It is believed that vampiric legends came to be as a way to understand the process of a body decomposing after death and as a way to understand the spread of disease. So let's go all the way back to the origins. Okay. And I'm sure that there are multiple stories that are this old, but this was one that I found that I thought was really badass and cool. Mm -hmm. And so this is what I'm going to tell. But again, I'm sure there are multiple vampire origin stories. But they're all wrong. This is the official... Right. Lunatic's official vampire origin story. You're going to put the stamp on it? Oh, yeah. It's been stamped. Get the stamp. It's been stamped already. Stamp it. It's been stamped. Okay. So this is the story of the scriptures of Delphi from Greek mythology. Oh, wow. There's a vampire in that? (laughs) Oh. There are some controversy about these scriptures. Some think that they are written by the Oracle of Delphi, and others think that they are a hoax. The Oracle at Delphi was many people. So it wasn't just one sort of magical oracle as depicted in 300, um, but it was whoever was the high priestess at the time of the temple. So this was across like thousands of years, right? Also, yeah, they all claim to be the high, they all claim to be the oracle, right? Well, they were. It was sort of like if you were the high priestess at the time, then you were also the oracle. Well, they also all claim to have the title, yeah, to protect the actual one, so that. It's like the whole, I am Spartacus thing. Mm -hmm. So that if there was ever like an attack or something like that. Got it. They would just all claim that to protect the one that actually has the gift of the time. Interesting. So the Oracle would enter a meditative state and allow the spirit of Apollo to enter her. The first recorded prophecies from the Oracle are from 800 BC. Oh. And this went on until Rome conquered the temple in 300 AD. So again, for... A second 300 reference. Yeah. So for many, many years, this went on. But we really want to focus here on how the history of this oracle in the temple relates to the vampire origin story, right? right? Vampires. Right. Vampires. Yes. There was a prophecy given to a young man named Ambrosio around 450 BC. Ambrosio. So there's your date. Yes. He was Italian. 450 BC. Cool. He is believed to be the first vampire. What? The prophecy that he was given from the oracle, these are the words that she said, according to the legend. The curse, the moon, the blood will run. The curse, the moon, the blood will run. Mm -hmm. Based off those three things, Uh I'd say we're talking about a werewolf. Well, hang on. The story goes that over the next few days, Ambrosio had trouble sleeping and kept running into Celine at dawn outside of the temple. Celine was the sister of the oracle and she also worked, you know, at the temple. And, of course, they fell in love. So, again, to give context, Ambrosio comes to the temple. He's looking for a prophecy, right? Mm -hmm. He gets this sort of creepy prophecy from the oracle. He's hanging around the temple. He has really strange nightmares, and he can't sleep. So he keeps waking up really early and running into Celine, who happens to be the sister of the oracle, right? And so they fall in love very quickly. They decide to be married and that she would return to Italy with him. Hard luck, however, that Apollo had also been in love with Celine. Mm. And Apollo cursed Ambrosio because he was so upset that a mortal would try to make moves on his love interest. So Apollo cursed Ambrosio so that the sunlight would burn his skin. Because of this, he was unable to meet Celine for their trip the next morning back to Italy. She was waiting at the boat all by herself. Ambrosio turned to Hades for help. So essentially Ambrosio sort of like ran off into the woods and found Hades in a cave. And Hades advised that he would need to win over Artemis, goddess of the moon in the hunt, who also happens to be Apollo's sister, and Artemis would be strong enough to help him. Hmm. So, here's where the story gets a little funky. Wait, wait. Our guy has to win over Artemis? Uh Uh-huh. The one that's famous for being a celibate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good luck, bud. Well, he doesn't have to win her over romantically. He just has to get her her to take pity on him. I see. Okay. So, for 44 days. Straight. 
Yeah, so for every day for 44 days. 44 swans. Yes, Ambrosio killed a swan uh-huh. and used its blood to write Selene a love poem Aww. and sacrifice its body to Artemis. I think he'd bottle something's blood. So he used to... No, no, because he... The thing was he wanted to use the blood to communicate with her. Got it. So he was using... <laughs> 44 swans. He was using the swan every day for its blood and then he would sacrifice the body to Artemis. That's nice. After 45 days and 44 dead swans, Ambrosio asked Artemis to borrow her silver bow and arrow. But after he tried to trick her, she tricked him so that silver was unbearable to touch. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Mm -hmm. This is the second reference to Mm -hmm. werewolves that I've heard so far. Just buckle up. You're about to, it's about to get real blurry in here. Ah, jeez. So anyway, so right. So he, he wanted her silver bow. She gave it to him and then he tried to trick her. And so she cursed him so that he had to drop the bow because it was unbearable for him to touch the bow because it was made of silver. Mm-hmm. So because he had lost his ability to see the sun, his ability to touch silver, and his soul to Hades, Artemis finally took pity on him and she gifted him with immortality, fangs, and the strength of a god. But she did take away his ability to procreate. Oh. So that he could, and also kind of like his ability to, I think, like make love and be romantic so that he could be with Selene, but he could never like be with Selene. Oh. Mm -hmm. And thus our first vampire origin story was created. And again, this is from 450 BC. That is how old the first vampire origin story is. Which is at least 50 years before Sunblock was invented. At least, yeah, at least 50 years. We can thank Slavic folklore for giving us the word vampire. Mm -hmm. First known as Upir in Russian. We first hear the word pop up in the 11th century. As with most of the history we talk about on this podcast, vampire legend in this region came before the arrival of Christianity. Mm -hmm. It is very commonly known that vampiric legends came about as a way to help understand diseases and death. Conditions like rabies, for example, and the decomposition of a body after death. So I'm going to spend a minute talking about body decomposition stuff. So if that freaks you out, you may want to skip ahead for a few seconds. I will be skipping ahead. Thank you. (laughs) After death, bodies can become bloated and change form slightly, which caused panic that the dead were rising again. Additionally, as the skin shrinks, it can make it look like the teeth or nails have grown longer. And as the organs decompose, (laughs) decompose, and as the organs decompose, a dark fluid can run from the mouth or nose, making it look like the dead had just drank blood. Many rituals to prevent this popped up as a coping mechanism. Burying bodies with poppy seeds and garlic, for example, which is where we see garlic come. But why? Because what? they thought that... What I don't it? know why. Oh, okay. Yeah. They thought that it would do something to help the, the dead stay dead. I was curious what, if garlic or poppy seeds would actually have sort of some kind of effect to stop like black seepage from the mouth or something. Right. Maybe. Or also staking bodies, burning bodies, or otherwise destroying a body after death to make sure that it is indeed dead. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. You're, you're not going to have seepage if you've put a big stake in there and all the fluid drains out through there. Right. Or if you've burned it. Or if you burned it, yeah. you're good to go. No, no peeled back lips if there's no lips. That's right. That's science. Because of changing political climates, the vampire rumors from this region became so rampant that the Austrian queen sent her personal physician to the area to investigate. He decided that there was no truth to any of them and published a scientific refute to the legends, which did help the hysteria a bit, but it couldn't stop the legends that were already ingrained in this society. Mm. Romanian vampires are also known as Mori from the... Mori? M-O-R-O-I. Yeah, sure, Mori. From the Romanian word mort, meaning dead. Mm. They are also known as Stigori. A third Romanian vampire is called Pricolisi and is a werewolf-vampire hybrid. Whoa. Yes. Strong underworld vibes. Yes, indeed. They were believed to be able to shapeshift at will into a wolf, and they, held out, and they actually held all of their power in their tail. What? And you could only be a Pricolisi if you were born with a tail. So you'll see this a few times. There, there's some birth defects where people are born with tails or sort of like mm-hmm. gross in that area. Mm-hmm. And it comes up a few times that they're kind of like using that, using like vamp, vampirism as a way to understand that. Sure. These Romanian versions of vampires were said to send out their souls at night to meet with other, uh, to meet with other vampires and drink the blood of livestock and people. Romanian vampires 
bit either between the eyes or over the heart. Between the eyes? Uh-huh. Isn't that kind of... How the hell do you bite someone between the eyes? Oh, I'll show you. And graves were often opened five or seven years after the death to check the body. Just to be sure. Just to be sure. Good old double tap. <laughs> after seven years. Just, so basically, after the bad luck from breaking the mirror runs out, uh-huh. you double check that they're not a vampire. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is like superstition capital of the world. Yes, indeed. Though in this Romanian version of the myth, people become vampires after death, and there are ways to know which people will turn. How? Tell us. For example, if you are born with extra body hair, an extra nipple or tail, oh, or a call, which is a membrane that can cover a newborn's face, uh, you are fated to be a vampire. R- remember uh, the book Good Omens? I sure do, by Neil Gaiman yeah. and Terry Pratchett. There's that one guy that is like a, I think, is he a vampire hunter? Mm-hmm. He's oh no, he's a witch hunter. Yeah. But his first question upon meeting everybody is how many nipples do you have? Yeah. And if, as long as they say two or less, you're good to go. You're good to go. Yeah. So of course, anyone that didn't fit in perfectly or had any kind of, you know, condition at birth was triple nipple was immediately fated to be a vampire. Or, and here's where things get really superstitious. If you happen to be born the seventh child in a family, mm-hmm. or if your previous siblings were the same gender, or if you were premature, or if you were born out of wedlock, or if your mother had a black cat cross her path. Well, I mean, yeah, the whole seventh son of the seventh son is the Antichrist. Mm-hmm. If a known witch or vampire looks at your mom, you're doomed. Oh, no, they didn't. And if you are born with red hair and blue eyes, forget about it. Which is actually interesting because the label of the vampire wine that we, or the werewolf wine that we opened in the last episode, Mm -hmm. it said on the back, if you have red hair or something that you're a werewolf. Yeah, I've never heard the red hair. I didn't either. And this was for vampires, but it was interesting. Well, interestingly, the girl from Brave has red hair and blue eyes. From the Disney movie Brave? That's right. She's not a vampire. Except that her mother turns into a bear. Okay. Did you just watch Brave? No. You just know a lot about it. Okay. So again, this region is very superstitious. She's a werebear. Yes. Not to be confused with the were-possum. So superstitious that they also believed if the pregnant person did not eat salt, their child could be a vampire. Everyone knows that. So you have to eat salt. Yeah. Salt is so important. I agree. Yeah. This is electrolytes 101. We see the vampire a novel by John William Palladori published in 1819, and Carmilla by Sheridan Lafanu in 1872, based on these myths. Hmm. So let's talk very briefly. Okay. And this is a fun section okay. of research here. Mm-hmm. Vampires in different cultures. Oh, okay. Go. There are some really interesting vampire legends across many different geographical regions. Stoker's novel gave fame to the Romanian superstitions, but they certainly were not alone. In Albania, vampire-like creatures were known to suck the blood out of babies while they were sleeping and then turn into insects. What? In Iceland, they believe that their ghosts returned with physical bodies. So, like, they're corporal ghosts. Hmm. There are two types of Icelandic undead. One is a protective force that often returns to its home and protects it. And the other is more sinister, a malevolent being that seeks to drive humans mad. The only way to kill one of these evil dead is to decapitate the corpse and drive nails into the body to pin it into the grave. It's badass. Mm -hmm. Ireland and Scotland are home to female vampires that seduce male victims around graveyards. Of course they do. And in Hungary, vampires are actually listed in the writings from the Inquisition. Hmm. And for about a century, starting in the 1700s, there was vampire panic in New England, especially throughout Rhode Island and eastern Connecticut, which so happens to be my hometown. Vampire panic. Mm -hmm. Was this before or after the werewolf panic? This was about the same time. Okay. These people love to panic. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, it was kind of like all in line with what was going on. This was before social media. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine if everyone had Facebook making memes about my my neighbor's a werewolf or my neighbor's a vampire? Send us your my neighbor's a vampire memes. I want to see them. Mm. It was actually tied. So back to New England. It was actually tied to an outbreak of tuberculosis or consumption, and it's named consumption because the disease seemed to consume or eat the victim's body. 
Mm-hmm. And so because of the way the disease sort of took over the body, we can understand, right, like how it would maybe be tied to like a, a vampire, yep. you know, legend. To combat this, the families actually exhumed the bodies of their loved ones to perform rituals to stop them from being a vampire. Would they nail them to things? Mm-hmm. All kinds of things. And I'm not going to talk too much about this because I think this would be a cool episode because, again, like where I grew up is right in the center of this. And there's actually some of the grave sites like not too far away. Oh, wow. And so it'd be cool to kind of like dive into that and sure. think about it. You yeah. know, the lawn where my trampling was could have had, you know, exhumed the lawn vampire. where your trampoline was. Right. Like on my on my parents lawn. OK. On the trampoline buried beneath. There could be bodies where people thought they were vampires right so they dug them up Mm -hmm. did something to them that we will not disclose Mm -hmm. and then put them back yeah Hmm. i mean they did all and it's all tied back to it was like people were dying so many people were dying of tuberculosis that they were trying to understand what was happening right you know because they didn't have all the memes to tell them how to be doctors that's right okay so now let's talk about dracula dracula we love Dracula. The one and only. Dracula is undoubtedly the most famous vampire of all time. He first appeared in Bram Stoker's novel Dracula in 1879, not that long ago compared to the origins of vampiric legend, right? Uh-huh. Stoker was heavily influenced by Lafano's Carmilla, which we, uh, which I actually read a few years ago, last year maybe, and it's a short story. Is it good? It's okay. I mean, it's very on the nose with sort of like vampiric legend, mm-hmm. and it's not super long. It's like a novella. So I would say if you're into deep diving into it, go for it. How close is it to Bram Stoker's mythos? It's not far. It's like a different, it's a different version of a story, but it's... Like, do they still sleep in coffins and do they... Oh, I'm not going to give and... away the, the story for people. Okay. Okay. Stoker was born in Dublin in 1847 and i didn't know this but apparently he was bedridden until he was seven due to an unknown condition Hmm. so in order to keep him entertained his mother used to tell him tales of her experiences with vampires with with a cholera outbreak including mass burials there were rumors that dracula is based on the real life vlad the impaler but it seems that this only inspired stoker in terms of naming his famous character yeah they were pretty different people but let's talk about vlad the impaler to oh, clear up any please. rumors what do you got so he was a ruler of wallachia which is a region of romania now known as transylvania wallachia wallachia three times during his lifetime he was born around 1430 and died around 1477 those are approximate dates he and his brother were held captive by the ottoman empire to secure legions from his father vlad Dracul, who was the current ruler <laughs> he is notorious for his cruel acts especially in battle he's been described as a sadist and a masochist it is interesting to know that with the invention of movable type printing presses huh. these stories were able to be distributed more broadly than they had before ramping up the hype around his demented methods well why don't you tell us why he was called the impaler well why don't you tell us well oh, i'm i'm happy to explain a bit about Vlad the impaler great he got his name. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory. He was an impaler. He was an impaler. He loved to impale people, mm-hmm. uh, which is kind of kind of messed up. But that that was kind of a shtick. He first got his name. Uh, he was at this dinner with two of his rivals, and he poisoned their food. Mm-hmm. And so, like while they're all poisoned, he just took them and threw them on big spikes in front of everybody. Mm-hmm. I guess he just like had the spikes ready. But after that, he kind of got known for his, like, impaling shenanigans. Mm-hmm. And so as he would go on to become this, like, crazy conqueror, his main M.O. for executing people, he would take these spikes mm-hmm. that were, in, dr- you know, driven into the ground. Yeah. And he would pierce people from the bottom. They would go in through the genitals and out the mouth. Ooh. And for some insane reason that I cannot explain, this would not kill people instantly. Oh. It would be a long, drawn-out death that would be kind of similar to crucifixion. Jesus. And you just leave people there. So, of course, you get known as the Impaler. Then people aren't going to mess with you if you're known as the Impaler. Yeah. No one I, wants to get impaled. I do want to say... Not me. I'm not defending him, but I do want to say that he was, like, held hostage by the Ottoman Empire for a long period of time. Yes. So he did not have an easy life. He came from a much harder, like, type He had of... some bad role models. Yeah. 
So it's a cycle, people, you know? So, exactly. This is why it's so important to love your kids and let them watch Sesame Street. That's right. It is believed that Bram Stoker was able to learn about the superstitions of the region from Emily Gerard's article from 1885. And again, he only found the inspiration from Vlad the Impaler around his namesake and reputation. Mm -hmm. In 1922, a German production company made Nosferatu based on Bram Stoker's novel. However, and this is where things get complicated wait a second what? nosferatu was based on the bram stoker's novel yep and so they Whoa. changed like it's so different yeah i mean not really though you don't think so no but they didn't pay any royalties or get any permissions to do this aha uh-huh. yes so though they tried to get away with it by changing the villain's name to nosferatu everyone saw right through it essentially there are very key details from the plot that totally gave it away mm. The studio had the shit suit out of it and ended up totally bankrupt. Now, here's where things get even more interesting. Because of this copyright mess, Stoker's widow sold the stage rights to a friend. This friend put on Dracula as a play starring none other than Bela Lugosi. Dracula the musical. And this theatrical run is actually the thing that made Dracula infamous, more so than the novel at the time. Huh. So enter our good friends Universal Studios. And let's talk about the Dracula film from 1931 that we all know and love. Which, it's a great movie. Right. Which also stars Bela Lugosi. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize this, but the Dracula was Universal Studios' first talking horror film. Really? Mm-hmm. What, what was their silent horror film? Did, what, sorry, what predates Dracula? I'm sure all kinds. I don't know. Hmm. We'd have to look it up. But I do want to linger on this for a moment because there are a few really important things to dissect here. First of all, think of how scary modern horror films can be and how much of that is because of the music or sound design, right? Mm -hmm. Sound design is so, so important in horror films. We all know that. Imagine how an audience from 1931 must have felt after seeing not only the first horror film with dialogue, but also the first purely supernatural premise. I mean, Dracula doesn't really pull a lot of punches either. It still holds up today. Yeah. Oh, totally. It's a pretty spooky movie. Right. But imagine how jarring that would have been for them. I mean, I can't even imagine. Yeah, totally. They're used to seeing, like, Singing in the Rain. No, they haven't seen that yet. Oh, that's right. What have they seen? Like films like Nosferatu, where he's running around a castle. That's too scary. (laughs) It must have dumbfounded and terrified them. This was a big risk on the part of Universal Studios, because releasing this sort of morbid film to a Depression-era audience was not a sure bet. However, as we discussed in the last episode, people thrive on horror in difficult times. You bet. And it skyrocketed past expectations and became a huge, huge hit for Universal. Once again, proving that audiences need escapism and distraction. Yep. As always, there's much confusion and debate around the who should star in this film. Um, Lon Chaney and Bela Lugosi were both sort of contenders, right? Chaney had actually been working with the director for about a decade on this property. Universal had uh, acquired it and Chaney had been interested in it and talking to the director for about a decade. Sadly, however, Chaney grew ill with lung cancer and the role passed to Lugosi, who had played it on the stage. Hmm. And though there is dialogue in the film, you can tell that the director wasn't totally comfortable with talkies yet, as Lugosi has limited dialogue, and I believe the book that my mom gave me describes it as a pantomime performance. He is very much a caricature. Yeah. Yeah, of an actor, really. Not only is he, though, like a silent era film actor, but he was also a stage actor, right? And so... Him, I think, transitioning into yeah. a world of, of dialogue and, you know, the nuances of that was Yeah, nuance was not burn. his specialty. Yeah, which is, you know, totally fair. Don't, I mean, that said, one of the reasons why I love it so much yeah. is because it completely lacks nuance. Yeah. It, yeah. it makes a lot of sense for his character. Yeah. He is a being in another world, really. Mm-hmm. He doesn't belong. And so he's walking around with this, like, crazy intense stare at everybody (laughs) yeah walking so stiff and with you know the it's like when what's his name um the first guy he cuts his finger reginald not reginald renfield renfield he cuts his finger at the very beginning of the film and dracula like does his super dramatic (laughs) like yeah exactly and it's it's just that kind of stuff where you're right like it's iconic because it really does almost like drive in the 
point about those characteristics, right? Yeah, he just has no, he has no censor. No, no. The series went on to include Dracula's daughter, son of Dracula, house of Dracula, and Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, where Lugosi... Don't, were... f- don't forget Twilight. Well, these are just the Universal Studios releases. And in uh, Costello, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, Lugosi returned to play his role as Dracula. <laughs> so now this is really fun. And you are going to have a lot to say about this, I know. I don't know. Let's talk about modern day beliefs in vampires. Don't believe in them. <laughs> that wasn't very hard. Yeah. One of the most recent accounts of vampires comes from the 1960s and 70s, and we're talking about supernatural vampires here. Okay. A man named Sean Manchester proclaimed that there was a vampire in London's Highgate Cemetery, and it was causing people to see strange things. Okay. And I actually think, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's this incident, the last podcast on the left does like a two or three part really deep dive into this, and so go back and find that because it's very very interesting but manchester was the president of the british occult society at the time so he was all kind of caught up in the web of occultism Mm -hmm. and there had been there had already been strange reports of a figure with burning eyes and strange floating spectacle and and strange floating things at the cemetery so the newspapers were sort of already covering that there was like weird rumors and, and sightings at the cemetery and then this guy who's the president of the occult society comes in and says oh that's a vampire (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah that, that, that's got you sounds there a uh, good, good old vampire yeah i can i can tell you manchester planned to exercise the vampire on friday the 13th causing hundreds of people to show up and watch however he did not end up going through because of course there was no vampire it was all media it was all sort of like a media play and sensationalized news taking over imagine that yeah but now let's talk about modern day, in quotes, real vampires. We weren't just talking about that? That was supernatural vampires. Oh. Now we're talking about like real vampires, like human vampires. So the last one was what I was supposed to talk about. No, this one. Oh, this one. Okay. Because I didn't have a lot to talk about. No, you, you know about this one. Okay. Of course, real vampires are biologically human. They are not undead or immortal. The only difference is that they have incorporated either feeding off of human or animal blood or feeding off of human energy into their diets. Vampires believe that they require blood or energy, and without it they feel weak and can fall victim to many physical conditions. They also say that this need pops up around or just after puberty, and some cannot go a single day without feeding, but some can go months. Some modern vampires choose to take part in gothic dress when they are coven's meat, and fake fangs and sort of, you know, go go into it that way. Mm-hmm. But some simply only feed on blood. And beyond that, you have had no idea that they've had this craving. Responsible vampires follow the Donor Bill of Rights, which was created to help maintain safety in the community. For example, real vampires should only perform these rituals with willing participants. And after everyone gets tested. And people pay a lot of money to be a participant. Some use needles and tubing to extract blood, and others use small but sterile knives or blades. This also goes for psi vampires or psychic vampires, who cannot take energy from unwilling participants. Psychic vampires feed by physical contact with a donor, skimming some extra energy from a busy public place, or tantric feedings during sexual intercourse. The show Dark Shadows is often credited for bringing together this community in the 70s at conventions for the soap opera. Tantric Shadows? Dark shadows. Dark shadows. I think you just got stuck on the word tantric. I kind of did. So don't you have some experience? I know we've talked about on the podcast, but you have some experience with somebody who thought they were a vampire. Well, yes. Um, Years ago, I worked on a movie called Love Bites. Mm -hmm. No, we made the movie Love Bites. What did I? Bite Me. Years ago, I worked on a movie called uh, Bite Me, which was a romantic comedy about real life vampires. And it was all the things that you just described protagonist was a mostly normal woman so this was fiction fiction based Mm -hmm. off a real life community living in brooklyn got it and she was a mostly normal woman that went about her day doing normal things however she had this medical condition that she had been to doctors for forever and no one could figure it out she was always so tired had absolutely no energy was constantly sick was like basically going through physical starvation Mm -hmm. despite having all the nutrition that was needed and all these things uh however she discovered this community of uh that practiced vampirism and she 
tried it and all her symptoms went away. And that was based on a real person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so not believing in it herself, Mm -hmm. of course. Sorry, not believing in it on a fundamental standpoint. Right. You can't argue with results. Mm -hmm. And just by partaking in the drinking of human blood, it would effectively cure her illness. Mm -hmm. Or rather, treat her illness. If I came to you. Yeah. And I said, Alan. Yep. I've... I'm feeling whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling sad and low energy. Yeah. Can I try your blood to see if it would make me feel better? Nope. You wouldn't let me? Probably not. I think we would explore a lot of other avenues first. Okay, but if we did, I get fired from my job. You'd get fired from your job? Well, because I'm so depressed or whatever. I can't function. I'm spiraling. Nobody can help me. You're not going to give me a taste? I just to really iron in the gravitas of the situation Mm -hmm. you would have to you would have to drink the blood of james first no because i can't willingly take blood from him he can't agree to that he can write he can't can't write okay james is a cat in case you don't know and he cannot write and i will not drink his blood okay so now this is stupid bit much like the characteristics of this monster itself Vampire legend has proven to be truly immortal, starting in 450 BC and still being just as socially relevant in 2020 with works like The Vampire Diaries, Underworld, Interview with a Vampire, True Blood, and of course, Twilight. The list can go on and on. Boy, but Alan, let's yes. talk about Twilight. Oh boy. Here's the time for you to come clean. I, first off, I love the Underworld series. Okay. Yes, I do too. I've watched... The, the whole thing mm-hmm. multiple times it's really awesome and it's a love story between a werewolf and a vampire mm-hmm. and they're kind of like weird hybrid situation now i knew about twilight and i thought that it was basically the same thing only much more romance mm-hmm. than action well but Boy, boy was i no uh it's, it's it's i mean that's pretty accurate but uh you and i d- during a moment of weakness watched twilight together i was having a bad day yes dur- yes and we watched <laughs> twilight together uh-huh. and i will not be ashamed to admit that i really really enjoyed it which is so funny because the first twilight movie is so, it's like laughably bad i still thought it was great but I, you know, having, you know, you and I are both avid readers, both avid movie watchers. Yes. And so when we watched Twilight, I could just tell that the story was pretty rushed. In the movie. In the movie, yeah. yeah. And so, but I still really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. What that says, what that said to me was that the book is going to be a lot better because it's not going to have those same pacing issues that you have, that you need when you're trying to cram something into a theatrical release. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I yeah. read the book, reading the book. Right. I'm I'm dangerously close to the end. You've been reading it for over a month. I'm a slow reader. And you're not. You've just been also reading other things. Yeah, I, I like to jump around between a lot of books yeah. simultaneously. So what do you think of the book? It's great. Yeah. It's a great book. I'll admit, I've read the series, I think, maybe twice. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's, it's, lot, it's good escapism. It's very good escapism. Uh, I, I was really expecting the quality of the writing to be abysmal mm-hmm. but it also i think it I'm, i confused it with 50 shades of gray oh yeah yeah it's not that yeah which i have not read but i i kind of lumped them together in the same category i mean yeah. but that's not fair mm-hmm. i'm constantly going the it's, all throughout twilight there's so much so much like use of a thesaurus yeah yeah <laughs> where i'm just like what's this word mm-hmm. which is great you know uh and the storytelling is great, and by the end, the, it gets so action-packed mm-hmm. that if you're not in it for the romance, even though you really should be because it's a great story, uh, the it just the action is incredible. Yeah, I will say the second half of the series, which I know you're not there yet, but it does become a lot more action-y than it is now. Mm. You know, it, it really picks up in like the third and fourth book. Also, I really enjoy the mythos of the vampires in Twilight. That they're all shimmery? Well... 
it, which which they explain in a very well no not the shimmery bit that's kind of ridiculous <laughs> i think it's cute i mean yeah, so they're like oh we're ultra sexy because it attracts our prey that i understand they they relate themselves to a poisonous flower mm-hmm. sorry to a carnivorous flower the venus flytrap you know projects something that's very attractive mm-hmm. to flies with its sweet nectar and its all its colors and whatnot so that they come into it willingly and that's how they feed right and so it makes sense where humans being the main prey of vampires would have to attract their prey to them lure them into this false sense of security so that killing them is a piece of cake yeah that's perfect traditionally sunlight is the enemy of vampires and in this case when they're in sunlight they just get even more beautiful i mean you can't really have like a teen high school set vampire ya drama if the guy if the vampires can't like play during the day right she had to work around that i disagree i mean there 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 are ways but it, i i that was the one thing that i'm like come on you just make him prettier but he can't day? go to high school if he can't i mean i do like that it's set in washington right so it's like mm-hmm. dreary all the time so you know well, they get away with it in this like, case it's only super intense directions directional sunlight yeah naked sunlight great everything else maybe it could reveal his ugly nature or something mm-hmm. no he just gets prettier yeah he gets prettier he's a vampire what are you gonna do i like that you're so upset about it though i mean i i'm i'm really trying to pull this one apart in some facet to justify the fact that i'm really enjoying the book <laughs> i don't think you need to justify it so beyond twilight what other like modern vampire stuff do well, you like I, I was actually about to ask you mm-hmm. who's your favorite vampire because i know mine who's yours who from all fiction or even real life if you happen to know one <laughs> the nate my neighbor i don't know off the top of my head actually i mean i think you would pick someone from twilight maybe i mean i like the i will say i really like the dracula's gals like it, when i was reading the his little harem yeah when i was reading the novel in high school i was like they're badass i like them um but they're probably not my favorite no i mean yeah i like twilight <laughs> I, I will admit i like twilight um i don't know let me think about it who's yours mine hands down uh-huh his name is regis okay he's from the witcher series okay and regis First off, the Witcher series is a freaking gold mine for supernatural beings. Oh, and uh, True Blood too. Actually, there's a lot of really cool vampires. In True Never Blood. seen True Blood. <gasps> oh, okay. Sorry. Talk about the Witcher, but True Blood is really cool. So, uh, I first was exposed to the Witcher in the video game Witcher Three, uh-huh. in which still witching, still witching. Yeah, uh, Regis is a character uh-huh. in the Blood and Wine story arc. However. Uh, I really got to know him through the Witcher novels. I think he shows up in either the third or fourth, but like he sticks with it and like he travels with the Witcher Mm -hmm. with, with Geralt on like for like three books. Mm. And so the thing that makes uh, Regis so interesting, first off, he's a barber surgeon. Yeah. Which for all of you who don't know, being a barber and a surgeon used to be the same job for some crazy reason. Mm-hmm. I guess you're just good with knives. Yep. He's also a higher vampire. So in the world of the Witcher, there's higher vampires and then there's regular vampires. Mm-hmm. And regular vampires are just beasts. Yeah. You know, they're the things, they look like bat creatures or just like deformed humans and they're just always out for bloodlust. And, you know, that that's like your typical Nosferatu-type vampire. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, think of uh, I Am Legend, mm-hmm. like those vampires. Mm-hmm. You know, they live in sewers, they lurk, they hurt people. Higher vampires are freaking awesome. They're, they're straight-up superheroes. Uh-huh. Think it's very close to, like, uh, the Twilight type, where they're basically invulnerable. Right. In, well, these vampires move even faster, where it's it's, you know almost like anime levels where like if you're if like a normal person is just watching you can't even see the two of them fighting right. it's just a giant blur right of like claws they can also transform into like their true form which is claws and you know wings and that sort of thing 
Uh, they can they have a whole s- a- array of mystical powers, near invulnerability, regenerative everything. But in true vampire sense, they're also super articulate. Uh, in in uh, Regis's case, they do he, they do feed, but only as a form of indulgence. In the whole Witcher universe, vampires drinking blood is not a necessary thing. It's just the biggest uh, endorphin release, aphrodisiac, whatever. And so it's really hard to resist because it's the most addictive drug imaginable. Right. But totally possible because it's not required for your own sustainability. Well, it's like in Twilight, they drink animal blood as that makes them like Mm -hmm. vegetarian. Yep. So it depends, yeah, on the mythos. Cool. So that's my favorite vampire. And he's really cool. And everyone should read the Witcher books because they're (laughs) awesome. Cool. I mean, I guess, I don't know. Like, I don't know. It feels lame to be like someone from Twilight is my favorite vampire. I don't know. Like, I think Dracula is cool. I think True Blood is just so good. I think you would actually really love True Blood. And there's a lot of really cool vampires and and stories there. So, I don't know. I'm not going to pick anybody specifically. I'm going to be lame. My second favorite is Victor from the Underworld series. Yeah, I was going to say, too, uh, Celine Mm -hmm. from Underworld. She's, like, probably the most badass femme vampire that I've seen. She's great. Yeah, so I, I love that. I love the mo- I, I love their modern take on everything vampires there. Yeah. Although I I don't know why this keeps happening, but like vampires are always depicted as like the super elegant classy type. Yeah. And then werewolves are just like the dirty brothers. You have a lot of uh werewolf pride. So, I think you're taking it a little personal. I do, but like why well, why why is all the why all the werewolf shame? We also just talked about this off air, but um, it's interesting that you see a lot of female vampires, but you don't see a lot of female werewolves and stuff. No. My only guess, yeah, and this is a total guess, yeah, is that werewolves usually transform and burst from their clothing. Yeah. And it would be inappropriate if women did that? No. It's like, it'd be kind of, usually after they transform, mm-hmm. you know? You're, you'd be able to identify whether it's male or female. Mm-hmm. Like, I guess if, like, a werewolf had breasts, it'd be weird. I mean, but female wolves don't have breasts. They don't? Well, I mean, not in the way... They don't look like human breasts. No, that'd be so silly. Yeah. So I think, you know, they would take on the attributes of the wolf. Mm-hmm. I guess it's hard to make a sexy werewolf. Although, you did a great job in She-Wolf. Thank you. Thank you. Especially in She-Wolf 2, Still Wolfen. <laughs> yeah. This is, I mean, shall we read the story? We got a story? We got a story. I didn't know we had a story. We have a story that my dad wrote. Oh, I love your dad's stories. Yeah. So I'm going to read that. Cool. Cool. <laughs> Dead Alive Again. Written by Chuck Branker. Read by Abigail Branker. It was an All Hallows Eve to remember. I returned from an evening of drinking with friends. There was much storytelling which I enjoyed, and the festivities went late into the evening. Though somewhat unsure in my feet, I did return home safely and well. But in an instant, that all changed as I found my trusted dog Molly and my manservant James dead. The poor old dog was eviscerated and appeared to be pulled, blood spattered on the walls and floor. James, on the other hand, looked asleep at first. A dead sleep. I tried to shake him awake, but his head fell to one side, and I noticed the puncture wounds on his neck. Two little holes with drops of fresh blood were present. Molly, what a good dog, appeared to have given her life in defense of James. All for nothing, and what was I to do? The vampires of the New Hampshire coast obviously had returned to hunt again. There had been much talk about a vampire community along the coast, but no one knew from where they came. I had heard the tales and read some of the old newspaper articles. I was certain that James was not merely asleep, but had been infected by the undead and might soon come for me. I knew the basic use of a wooden stake in the heart and garlic shoved into the mouth of the poor old soul. I quickly found a tomato plant steak and a big hammer to help drive it deep into James's heart. From the kitchen, I grabbed a clove of garlic, and from the wall, I took the cross of the Lord. As I approached, the eyes of the fiend flickered and finally opened. The devil himself knew I was soon to end his undead existence. His once gentle eyes were now red dots searing into me, and I refused to look into them. To hesitate was my certain death. 
I started striking that stake deep into his heart. Such a horrendous cry admitted from the fiend's mouth. I knew it wasn't James anymore. As I hit the stake home, his blood gushed out of his mouth. The monster's eyes were now wide open, and I pounded the stake over and over and over again with all of my strength. The dead now left James. He seemed at peace again in his mortal state. Still, I put the garlic in his mouth and laid the cross across his chest. James was mortal again. Panic and fear now took hold of me, and I ran into the street looking for help, not knowing where I was going or what I was going to do. I hardly noticed that a cold rain now fell down on me, and I slipped and slid on the cobblestones of old Portsmouth. Up ahead I found an old pub, and I somehow made for it. Inside I found no one at first, but soon saw blood scattered about. The plague of the undead had already made its presence here. I found the barman on the floor, mutilated beyond recognition. A great force had hurled him and torn him apart. His neck was twisted sideways in a most unnatural and grotesque way. Death came hard to him. I looked about the pub and saw an old man in a darkened corner. I couldn't tell if he was alive or undead as he didn't move. I approached slowly. Soon, I saw a weather-beaten face that I recognized. His eyes were open, but in a deep, distant stare. I heard him murmuring something that I found hard to understand. I listened several times as he repeated something about the plague of the mist has returned. I grabbed a bottle from behind the bar, and after a few swigs, he seemed to compose himself a little. It's the plague of the mist returned again, he said, and he added, it's the plague of the undead. I wanted to know how to save our souls. I wanted to know why the vampire passed by him. His mind seemed cluttered, or was he in shock? I believed I understood him to say, Sixteen years ago, I went out for an evening of fishing. I come back to the house early in the morning and see my two beautiful children torn from limb to limb and my wife nowhere to be found. Where did she go and why did she leave? I knew the kids were taken by the monster that roams the coast, but where was my wife, I always wondered. Until tonight, that is. I see a mist appear under the door and soon I see the monster just there, right by the bar, and she pounces on old Jake the barman. After she devours old Jake, she slowly turns and looks at me. Her red eyes pierce my very soul, and I look away from her as quick as I can, and she is gone. After a few minutes, I hear him say, I know where to find her. I know where she sleeps, and I want to give her mortal sleep. Though very early in the morning, we head down to the waterfront and find a dory with oars. I'm armed with a wooden stake and hammer. The old man just sits paralyzed in the back of the boat. As the storm rages outside, I fear one is also raging inside the old man. Row southeast, he says, and nothing more. As the little dory climbs the waves and gets pushed by the winds, he tells me of the nightmares that have taken hold of his life since the loss of his family. Not a night goes by without some sort of ghostly vision, dream, or even premonition of what will be. He has existed, but not lived, for these sixteen long years since the last attack. He says he has thought about what he would do if he ever saw the monster again. But he froze this evening. Fear paralyzed him. Though high winds and waves seem to block our way, I soon see the Shoals lighthouse and know we're close. Sunrise was now on the horizon, and I asked the old man which island is home to the undead. He simply said, Star. I had heard a legend from pirate days that Blackbeard had buried a vast treasure on the island of Star, but it was never found. Hard to imagine that anything could hide on the shoals for long, as they are blown from the wind and swept by the seas. Many a summer treasure hunter has looked, but nothing has ever been discovered. A few treasure hunters went missing each year, presumably from the elements, but legend often has some part of truth in it, and the old man told me that he knew exactly where we'd find the vampire. My wife used to love coming out to these islands on a summer day. The kids would take hikes on the trails, and often they'd play hide-and-seek. I remember a deep cave on Star, where we were afraid to go but not my wife. She loved going deeper and deeper into it. It's there that we'll find her, but we can only get there on low tide, and the opening is for a very short period. Just beyond Gosport Harbor, we'll find a steep rock cliff with a big rock in the sea. That's Devil's Rock, and at low tide, there's an opening between the rock and the shore, and inside that opening is a cave. That is where the devil herself will be found. I pulled the dory onto a rocky beach and we got out, but the tide was still too high for entry into the cave. As we wait, he tells me that in the bar, he looked into her eyes and pleaded with her to take him, to kill him, to end his misery. So he was now ready to confront the fiend, as his life was over. His last breath was soon to be taken. Slowly, I see a crack open on the rock wall and try to gather strength from what I must do. 
The old man seems resolved to tag along with me. Painfully slow, the water recedes, and as we enter, it's still chest high. The going is tight, needing to turn my body sideways at times, and one large wave could end it for us, but we proceed. There is little light, and the old man breaks out a lantern he had brought. The smells are pungent, not ocean smells, but rather of death and decaying flesh, but we push further into the cave. I begin to see human bones of the dead littered about. It's terrifying that we are now in the monster's den. And there ahead of us is a coffin, set up on the rocks. The fiend herself is here, and no way out now as the sun shines brightly outside. We must act quickly, as our nerves are frayed. The ocean will soon rise and block our exit. The fiend will rage. I step forward and lift the lid to the coffin, while the old man stands stiff like in a trance. As the lid is opened, I catch a glimpse of her red eyes. They now see me. I now throw open the lid, and the vampire sits up. A hiss emits from the depths of her undead soul. Her reign of terror is about to come to an end, but not without a fight. I have the wooden stake at the ready, but hesitate to strike her, and in that instant she is upon me with superhuman strength. I am paralyzed against this monster, but from my side there is a blast, and this evil creature falls back into her coffin, soon to regain her once beautiful human form. The vampire is gone. Standing next to me, the old man drops the pistol he carried. A silver bullet in the heart gave my wife a mortal sleep, he says. He leaves the cave as I impale her heart with the stake and put garlic into her mouth. As I quickly get out of the cave before the water rises, I see a chest against the far wall. Some legends are true. Beautiful. The end. Cool. Written by Chuck Branker. What a guy. And you can read it in the autumn uh, issue of Lunatics Magazine. I thought this was familiar. Yeah, but it was cool. I actually, so this summer when we were up in Maine, we were, at, you know, we go to Maine every year as a family. I was there. You were there. And one night it was a full moon and my dad uh, is a big rower. He rows kind of like... All the time, all day, every day. Yeah, but he rows like uh, like ocean skulls, like crew boats, but for single rowers and but he has a a a new boat now that has room for two and so we went out in like it was like the full moon and rolled and rode around the river and it reminded me of the part in the story where the two guys are rowing out to the island and a lot of the names of the islands and things and, and the areas are near areas where we go up there and molly and james well molly james and also jake who is my parents dog right when they were uh, when right. they lived in new orleans mm-hmm. yeah so it was cool. Yeah, he included he included everybody in there. You're, I mean, it, the it, this is a very Chuck Branker story. Oh yes, especially it has all the nautical themes. Yes, I mean, also his his it's a, he rows a very serious boat. Oh I, yeah, I he let me take it out just once, and I still bear the scars <laughs> from that one day. I I still have the two giant scars on my feet from well. just thirty minutes of rowing. Yeah, I mean, that's just you need better water shoes, but... It was an intense boat. Yeah, we're, we're it's an intense that. boat. Yeah, he's an intense guy. And he writes say. a great vampire story. Yeah, he and he, yeah, I think he enjoys writing them, so it's cool that he's part of it. I like that it was very um, entrenched in traditional mythos. Yeah, for sure. It reads as like an old-timey tale. It does. Which I like. An old-timey vampire nautical tale. Yeah, an old-timey sea shanty vampire tale. <laughs> perfect yeah no it's great i love it and this is totally off topic okay but i do want to give one movie recommendation okay that is not vampire themed nor is it horror but we just watched it and it was really really good the devil all the time oh yeah which is on netflix and it's not horror so maybe you want to save it for november or whatever if you're a horror seeker in october but it was really really good and it's almost like uh the level of like violence is almost like a Quentin Tarantino movie, I would say. Maybe not quite as much, but it's it's graphic. But it's really cool, well done, kind of like one of those stories that's multiple people's journeys that intersect, you know, et cetera, et cetera, but it doesn't feel cliche at all. It's not quite Rashomon in the whole same uh-huh. situation happening from different perspectives. No. But it's a very intertwined tale where simultaneously simultaneous things are happening to different characters. And I thought about it because Robert Pattinson, who plays mm-hmm. Edward in Twilight in the movies, is in this movie. 
great. It, it Overall, it's just really top-notch storytelling. Yeah, and I'll say, like, we, in the past, I don't know, three years, no, in the past, like, few months, we haven't watched a lot that isn't horror, mm-hmm. and it was nice to watch something, and I really, really enjoyed it. I mean, it was marketed as horror. Yeah, I thought it was going to be, but maybe that was just my mistake. It's not horror at all. It's n- the closest thing would be a it's like a, like a graphic it's a dark, drama. It's a dark drama. Yeah. Yeah. Graphic drama is the way to go. Because, yeah, there's thriller elements to it. Yeah. But I wouldn't call it a thriller. No, totally not. Graphic drama is the way to classify it. Yeah. But there's there's some violence. Mm-hmm. Some of it is explicit. Mm-hmm. But that is drastically overshadowed by just the pure storytelling of the characters. Totally. Yeah. And one thing I realized, actually, is that the guy who actually wrote the book... Uh, he does the voiceover narration as the narrator in the movie, which was kind of cool. Oh, how about that? Yeah. And one other quick recommendation is The Haunting of Bly House, I think. Uh, it's on Netflix. It's Bly House, mm-hmm. The Haunting of Bly House, I think, something like that. I started watching it yesterday. I think there's nine episodes, and I'm now on, like, seven or eight. Just wow. in one day, I watched, like, a lot of them. It's, I would say it's, like, a little bit less scary version of The Haunting of Hill House. Which is very scary. Yeah, like I was able to watch it by myself, even though there's a lot of wow, jump scares. That's the music. saying a lot. Yeah, because like there's a lot of music crescendos, but usually like I can handle what's happening. Um, and the character development is really cool. And it's sort of like a retelling of The Turn of the Screw, which is one of my favorite. You love The Turn of the Screw. Yeah. So I was happy that I stumbled on that yesterday. But anyway, just some Netflix recommendations. Well, I want to give a recommendation as well Mm -hmm. and this one is on disney plus okay and it has to do with vampires oh great so for all you out there that are looking for a really cool vampire story Mm -hmm. check out the 1994 spider-man cartoon okay one of his villains turned anti-hero turned villain it goes back and forth Mm -hmm. morbius that's a cool name. It's a very cool name. And it actually pulls from the mythos that we we drew at the beginning of the episode. Because he's a vampire. Mm-hmm. But, uh, so, in this case, it's because, oh, what the hell do they call it? The new, new genic recom- neogenic recombinator, some bullshit sci- sci-fi mumbo jumbo. Uh, he's trying to fix some kind of condition uh, because he's suffering from it, and a bat flies into the, the neogenic recombinator, whatever it is, and he gets merged with the DNA of a vampire bat. Oh, cool. This is also the same technology that makes the lizard, if mm-hmm. you're familiar with the lizard. Got it. Another amazing vampire. Sorry, not vampire. Another amazing Spider-Man villain. Got but it. Morbius doesn't feed off blood, sort of. He feeds off plasma. Okay. <laughs> very similar to blood. Uh huh. But I think that's to keep uh, a very PG rating. Got it. But he doesn't bite people. He's got these little suckers on his hands. Mm-hmm. He puts it on people and they get super sleepy. Got it. Well, so check that out too on Disney Plus. Disney Plus. There you go. So this is it. This wraps up our. What? This has got to be off after my Spider Man rant. Is there anything else you want to say? No. About? So this is it. Oh, this, wait. Uh, uh, I have one more vampire recommendation, and okay. I'm surprised it hasn't come up. Okay. What do you think about Blade? I've never seen Blade. All right. But I'll watch it if you're recommending it. I mean, the first one is great. Mm-hmm. The second one's a lot of fun. The third one is a hot, hot pile of garbage. Cool. So, yeah, this wraps up our monster deep dive. Do we have any closing monster thoughts? I mean, I just gave mine with Spider-Man and Blade, which are both Marvel superheroes. Oh, well, there you go. You can actually watch Blade hunt Morbius. Okay. In the Spider-Man cartoon. Okay. We will look forward to that. I mean, I don't have any thoughts about that because I haven't seen those things, but I do have thoughts about the monster series as a whole, which are that I think it was a cool investigation of what drives humans right to create these things and what the, our need is as like coping mechanisms during hard times. Yeah. You know, and what I feel like the way, the reason why 
a lot for me specifically supernatural horror is so appealing is because it's so outside the realm Mm -hmm. of the of, of possibility right you know I don't understand everyone's huge obsession with true crime. Mm-hmm. That's scary. You know, that's terrifying. Because that's a way of like self-defense, like learning the what the killers are going to do, learning how they think so that you can survive that situation. That's like an extreme fear mechanism. Right. But that's entertainment. I mean, it, well, this is a whole conversation. I don't think we need to get into <laughs> it now. <laughs> but for me, I, you know, I'd much rather watch some supernatural beast. Uh huh. You know, because that is so outside the realm of possibility. That's just pure entertainment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I can. I can see that. Well, thank you all so much for spending so much of your time this month with us. Upcoming, you can look forward to you can look forward to two more episodes from us this month. But the one that's coming out on Halloween is really, really special. We've talked about it a few times, but it's essentially a full ensemble cast radio drama that we've been working on for a very, very long time. It's pretty good. It's great. Yeah. Alan's been editing it and me and Michael Crosa from Jollyville wrote it for a few months and it's been a really cool journey and project. So massive collaboration. Yes. On all fronts. Yes, absolutely. We are so excited to... The likes of which have never been seen. We are so excited to have that ready for you guys for Halloween. It's Um, pretty cool. Yeah, it's very cool. And also, of course, as always, you can find us at The Lunatics Project on Instagram. You can follow us on Patreon if you'd like to give a little bit to this community. And of course, we have tons of fun rewards and perks there for you. We have a magazine, which you can find on Etsy and linked in the description of this episode. And of course, my book Horror Stories is now available on Amazon. Uh, you can get a paperback or a Kindle version. And I really appreciate everybody who has already picked up a copy. It's been really, really exciting to kind of, invo- you know, and scary to, to have it out in the world, but very rewarding too. So thank you all so much. And for all you know, it's an extremely limited edition. I could pull it any second. Any second. So get it now <laughs> get, yeah. while you can, while it's still available. Well, it's good for Halloween, too, because Bef- they're short, scary stories, so you could go through them pretty quick. Your choices are either get it now mm-hmm. and enjoy the hell out of it uh huh, or have to buy it as a collector's item off eBay right. for billions of dollars. That's right. That's right. Those are your two options. Yes, exactly. Thank you for your uh, very positive review, Alan. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. I hope you're all being safe. I hope you're all voting. I hope you're all doing everything we need to do to be good human beings and to fight for what is right. And as always, we love you very much. We're very thankful that you are here listening to us. If you have gotten this far in the episode, you are a saint. And we will talk to you next time. Bye. Goodbye. If you want to support the show and help us continue to bring you higher quality episodes, consider joining our Patreon. You'll get access to bonus videos, get our quarterly horror magazine automatically, and you'll be able to join our monthly group horror screenings on Netflix Party, plus receive fun surprises in the mail. The Netflix Party is a lot of fun. You've been enjoying it? I, in, immensely. The best part is, among all the Patreons, there's this big voting process. Yes. So everyone gets a say in what you watch. Mm-hmm. You know, it's always fun when you have a horse in the race. Mm -hmm. And then when you finally get there, being able to live chat with everybody else during the movie, especially when you're watching some kind of horror movie that you really don't want to be watching all by yourself, it just makes it so much fun and you watch a lot of great movies. Yeah, I really have been enjoying that. I think we'll continue that forever. It's been great. That's great. We are so appreciative of the Patreon community and all of the wonderful listeners and friends who help fund this project. Click the link in the description of this episode for more info. Coming to you from the Paranormal Warehouse, Destination Mystery paints the story for paranormal content, abnormal adventures, and the fun behind the investigations. Each week, Mike and Melissa will bring a new adventure that includes going to some of the most remote places in the West. They will tell the story behind the investigation and share with you the evidence they discover. This is not your regular paranormal show. These episodes will bring new content from locations that no one would think to investigate or explore. We will not only tell the spooky story, we will go to the location where the spooky story originated. Fasten your seatbelts as we take you on an adventure that will make you question what's normal and what's paranormal.
If you want to support the Lunatics Radio Hour podcast, consider joining our Patreon. For as little as $1 a month, you get access to bonus episodes, access to Lunatics Magazine, and all kinds of other fun perks. You can also support the show by picking up some of our really cool, fun new merch featuring gorgeous designs by Pilar Keperta. That's available on Teespring, and you can follow the link in the show notes to find that. And one of the most important things you can do to help small podcasts like us grow is to rate and review on Apple or anywhere else you listen to Lunatics Radio Hour. Every review really does go such a long way. And of course, you can follow us at The Lunatics Project on Instagram. Thank you.